Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is the 530 Cybersecurity One. You guys close one's code rooms and that's one. Um, <coughs> how are you guys doing this evening? No dinners after this, right? Yeah, that's right. So I'll keep to my time so you guys can go to eat. Uh, start off, uh, Charles and Green and And this is what I'll be talking about. All right, so this is our agenda for this evening. And this is me. I'm a uh, SOC team lead at Centene. Uh, this is my alphabet soup, which means I've done a lot of training. Code 1 and 2, go in school, as you guys are doing, it's a focus on cybersecurity, networking, uh, systems, virtualization, and things of the like. Uh, this is Centene. If you didn't see it downstairs at the booth, this is the same information, similar over 53,000 employees. Um, we do provide managed care services, currently Fortune 51, and that should change uh, in the future as we strive to uh, get in that lower tiers of the Fortune uh, 100. So this is data breaches. I'm sure some of you probably heard of some of these things that have gone on. Granted, this is from 2018. Uh, average cost, 7.91 million here in the United States, which means we're paying out the most money uh, per company when this stuff happens. Uh, there is a cost associated to it, and this is the reason why I'm bringing it up, because you guys are kind of in the forefront as coders. Um, between 2009 and 2018, uh, this is what you're looking at as breaches reported. Reported breaches are typically uh, 500 people or more. Is That's a compliance requirement. If there's 500 or more people, that's considered a reportable breach. Some people will report it it's lower than that. All right, so this here is the cybersecurity compliance frameworks. You have NIST, which some of you may have heard of. Um, usually it's NIST 800-53, revision four. There's also revision five, which looks more at the privacy component. And then the cybersecurity framework, which is what a lot of companies are going to. Uh, with the NIST cybersecurity framework, it also takes into the supply chain into account. So moving things from point A to point B and where they're stopping in between. As for the cybersecurity frameworks using the stop threats, you have the MITRE ATT&CK framework, and then you also have the Lockheed Martin Cyber Kill Chain. What those are doing is they're looking at different parts that an adversary would take to get to the end objective and trying to stop them as they're going through those parts. For example, say someone goes to hack into your network. What's the first line of defense usually? It's something on the uh, outer perimeters, like a fire. At least that's the first thing people think of, right? Um, once they get past the firewall, what else could it be? On your endpoint, you may have, does anybody have Symantec or McAfee on their laptops? It's a proper participation point. <laughs> yes. Okay, cool. So that's you know, something else that's going to help stop the uh, threats from getting in. So what those two things look at is how can we stop the threat at each phase or each phase as it's making its way into the environment? All right, so this is the incident response cycle. This here is a lot where I work at um, with Centene as a cybersecurity monitoring team. A lot of our focus is the detect. The threats are coming in, we're detecting them, and we're reacting to those threats and using the tools as well to help detect those threats. We look at detecting it, containing it, making sure that it doesn't spread. We're going anywhere else. Um, we're eradicating the threat, so depending on what it is, uh, we're getting rid of it, or working with the incident response team to do that. And then of course recovery is just bringing everything back to normal. Um, and then reviewing, okay, did we do the processes and procedures correctly? If we didn't, okay, what do we need to fix? Is there a better way to do it? You know, can we be more efficient in how we do it? Defense in depth. So the key thing here is the data. That's the most important thing in any organization. As you guys are building your applications, you're basically going to have data in the center of all that. You know, that's where the money is. If you go back to the earlier slides, you know, people are, speak, are getting fined, you know, millions of dollars because they're not protecting the data. And when you look at all the privacy things that have come out lately, you know, you have CACPA, the California Privacy Act, New York apparently has one coming out that's more stringent than California. Uh, you have GDPR. So all those different things is about you know, protecting data, and these are the different ways that we do it. 
We have policies and procedures that need to be in place for compliance purposes. We got physical security because your data centers are always behind the, you know, behind the wall somewhere. We've got networking monitoring, firewall intrusion prevention, you know, antivirus softwares. Patching is a big thing. Can anybody tell me what's uh, one of the things that came out with patching over the past week? Mm. You guys all have apples, huh? <laughs> all right, who's got a Microsoft device? Okay, one, two, three, four. You hear anything about Microsoft over this past week? Yeah. They came out with a patch, and now they got to patch the patch because it didn't work. So, uh, integrity checkers, that's looking at, you know, making sure that the data is good data. And if you ever hear of you know, hashing algorithms, that's a way to check for integrity of your uh, data. It's also an energy question. If anybody ever asks you what you know, hashing is, just say it's for integrity. <laughs> you might have to explain that, but, you know. Okay, so host base versus network base. Everybody in here has a host based device. Uh, it's the laptop you're working on, the tablet, or even your phone. <clears throat> Networking, you're all used hooked up to the network right now, right? Everybody's using Wi Fi. Or your phones are going through Verizon, ATT, Sprint, or whatever else. So uh, those are your two different network options. To be honest, I usually tether my phone as opposed to going off of whatever the uh, network everybody else is using, but that's just me. Uh, so for host based monitoring, for Apple, what's the uh, antivirus software you guys use? Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Is anybody else? Or none of you guys have an Apple security on Apple? They do have uh, vulnerabilities. But the difference is, what are the majority of devices out there? Especially when you look at servers. You know, how many Apple servers are there? You know, I mean, man, there's a $9,000 cheese grater, but how many people have gotten that, right? Um, and that's actually not a server, that's a desktop, right? <laughs> so, um, yes, the Mantec, which is an endpoint protection, it's something that, if you have Microsoft, you usually have to use Defender, so it comes natively still. Um, or you swapped it out for Symantec or McAfee. If you have a mobile device, do any of you guys have uh, security on your mobile device? Or you're trusting Apple? That's not what I'm saying. Hey, gotta trust somebody, right? Um, well, there's a lookout for mobile devices, and I believe that's for both Android and uh, iOS. So it's something to take into account. I mean, you might want to download it, run it, and see what happens. You can always get rid of it, right? It's free software. Uh, network based monitoring, these are some different tools that you can use for network based monitoring. These are all open source. You have Snort, Sericata, Security Onion. They're looking at a lot of the traffic that's going through your network and telling you whether there's bad, um, if so, what kind of bad it might be. A lot of this is command line driven, so it's not a GUI. Uh, but since you guys are doing coding, you're used to looking at command line stuff. So I wouldn't think it's that difficult. Um, is there anyone here that's taken a networking class? One, two, three. Okay, so you're familiar with IPs, ports, protocols, and all that. Yeah, looking at something like Snort, Security Onion, you'll see that traffic go by, and you'll get to recognize a lot of that stuff going through. Uh, you'll see the IPs, you'll see the port. So it's something you can play with. And you put it on your own network and see how that, you know, think what's going on in your own network at home. And actually, that's something you all might want to look at doing, is just try Wireshark. You know, that's a GUI-based, it's a little bit easier to use, and you might be able to see some traffic going on in your own network that you didn't realize was there. Like the printer next door. <clears throat> All right, cloud computing. Well, we just had Google in here, so they had a chance to talk about that. Uh, these are pretty much your three main cloud uh, providers in the U.S. And of course, the pay as you go service. So I think everybody was in here for the Google talk. The really the only difference is is one Google, one Microsoft, one Amazon. Um, they all have the same services, so I won't continue into that one. Um, now even with cloud computer, cloud security, um, computing, you've got compliances as well. Um, this is a government one. So if you ever develop something and the government says, well, you didn't do this right, then you say, well, I used your documentation, so how did I not do it right? You know, you're kind of like pointing the finger back. 
Um, you got PCI DSS, which deals with credit cards. And HIPAA, which is a big one, is probably something that the majority of you heard of. HIPAA is really based on portability. And that is being able to get data from one place to another as easy as possible. Um, it added, didn't the, the privacy and security components came on later. And that's when we're looking at, okay, can we secure the data and make sure that the right people have access to the data, not just anybody. You know, are we securing the privacy of the data? Because, you know, the gentleman over here, he probably doesn't want this guy over here knowing what his data is because, hey, it's none of his business, right? That's his own stuff. However, you have companies, I'm going to talk about the dark web. Um, there's people that like to get a hold of healthcare data because they will take that and sell to somebody. I mean, if you think about customs, trying to get in from one country to another, if you have a clean bill of health because you managed to get a hold of, uh, who's a good athlete out there? Name a famous athlete. Okay, I'll start with Tom Brady because I recognize that name. <laughs> okay, so if his health record gets sold to somebody in a different country, but this somebody has uh, maybe tuberculosis, now that person uses that health record to get to the U.S. and now you got an epidemic. So that's where like a lot of the money comes from that, and they realize, oh, we need to make sure that we have privacy and security as well as affordability. Responsibilities, when it comes to cloud, cloud security, it's not just the vendors, it's definitely on you as well. And some of that is making sure your systems are patched up, making sure your code is good, you know, making sure that uh, your internal threats are you know, not there, you know, you bet everybody that comes to work with you, work for you, or that you're interacting with. Now, of course, you expect the cloud companies to also do the same thing, right? All right, so when I looked at the incident handling response cycle, I figured the best place to say programmers would be was in preparation. And the reason why I say that is because that's like the start. The first thing you're looking at doing is you're making sure that you have good code, secure code, and yeah, you're definitely fighting time to market because your boss is down your throat saying, hey, you need to get this done now. Now, of course, you're all here in college, but you'll see this after what, one, two, three, four years when you graduate. Boss and say, hey, we need this now. And you're like, okay, but. Um, so this is things that you might want to remember. Is when they're saying we need this now, say, yeah, but there's this here problem that we need to fix first. And let them realize this is a security problem. And that's why you want to have the security folks up front. Now also, you can be on the back end, recovery. You know, let's go back to the Microsoft patch. They're trying to recover from the issue. Oh, there's also Citrix. Is anybody familiar with that one? <clears throat> and uh, I think right now there's some companies that are probably dealing with coin miners on their Citrix house. So yeah, they're coin for uh, mining for Bitcoin. Um, so right here is the OWASP secure coding best practices. Anybody can download this, anybody can use this, it is open source. This is something that would be ideal for anyone using the coding to use, regardless of whether you're doing web, app, or anything else. Input validation, output, authentication session, access control, cryptographic, yada, yada, yada. We're going to go through all 14 of these. All right, so the first five, input validation. So as it says here, you're looking at server-side validation. And to put the examples of the suite, Zap proxy, if you're doing client-side validation that is quicker, because it's right there, it's validating the person as they go. But if you're using one of these tools, you can capture that traffic before it even goes out to the server, manipulate it, or manipulate it on the back end. And so now, instead of someone, say, paying $100 for a pair of shoes, they're paying $10. Hey, why not you pay them to buy the shoes? So now they made some changes, and all of a sudden, you're wondering why it is that you just paid somebody 10 bucks to buy a pair of shoes for you. So some of these proxies allow you to manipulate that because you didn't have the server-side validation going on. You're just doing it on client-side. So I see one person writing, are you taking notes? Actually, if you just write down OWASP.org, you can get this. That's like the main website, probably easier. <laughs> um, output encoding, 
same thing. We're looking at trusted systems. What you're going to see a lot of is trusted systems. Because as you're doing everything, you want to make sure that you're using systems that you trust, systems that the company trusts. If you're doing it as a group, you know, if you have peers that are sitting there working on the system, make sure that you're all you know, familiar with what it is that you're working from. You know, if you give a link to somebody, if they're all using the same system, not all of a sudden somebody just types something and all, they're doing something somewhere else, you're doing something somewhere else, and you're wondering, okay, well, why is it you're not getting my stuff? And all of a sudden, somebody competing, get your stuff, and wonder what just happened. Uh, authentication and password management, key, 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 you know, of course, can't stop on this one enough. Even though now we're looking at multi-factor authentication as well. Um, depends on, I guess, the criticality of the information. Uh, I think with a lot of tools, um, I think everyone's email probably has a you know, biometrics option or a multi-factor authentication option. There's a Duo or Google Authenticator or Microsoft Authenticator. Um, session management, always make sure you trust the systems, which is you know, kind of a the theme of several of these. And of course, you know, using trust systems for server side authentication and communication. You know, are you communicating with the right systems? Does somebody step in the middle of that communication and all of a sudden now you're authenticating with them and not the system? Because now they're redirecting your traffic. Cryptographic practices. So for cryptographic practices, I get it. You have somebody who's a really smart programmer. And they say, you know what, I'm going to build my own crypto encryption. Bad idea. Bad idea unless they're releasing it to the, the community to validate. You want to make sure that you're using you know, cryptographic practices that are out there, that are well known, that are trusted, because those are the ones that work. If you decide to come up with your own, you're like, oh, yeah, I'm going to create this code, it's going to be awesome, and I'm not going to tell anybody about it, but I'm going to use it. You'll probably get hacked with it. A week. Um, error handling, you definitely want to make sure that when you're creating something, so create your app, it hits back an error because somebody put something in wrong. Do you really want to tell that person what the error is? I mean, of course, you want to know what it is as a programmer. So while you're in development and test, you know, okay, what's the error? Okay, it's not giving me the right information. You know, maybe it's saying that I need to add an extra character or have you ever logged onto a website and it gives you that top line of code, which is actually from a, it's like a Microsoft server, and it's talking about the uh, ODBD objects? It's a lot of blank faces. Okay. Well, then you're lucky. <laughs> but sometimes if you log onto a site and it just dumps out some empty <laughs> code, then there's probably a problem, but you don't want people to know that. Because one, that means your site's bad. Two, if somebody really wants to hack into your site, how they know using um, an SQL server on the back end, and you're probably using an uh, IIS server on the front end. So now, okay, I go ahead and scan your server, maybe I'm using Shodan, or I could just do a hit map off it, find out what your, um, your vulnerabilities are, just go look them up online, boom, now I just got you. Uh, data protection, least privilege. If you don't need to have access to it, don't bother. If there's somebody that doesn't need to have access to it, just let them know, hey, sorry, this is a project we're working on, but it doesn't concern you. We still go out and have a copy though, especially if you're buying. You know. uh, communication security. This here's another one, which is actually kind of a, an interview question that can come up every once in a while. Is SLF, SSL is older than TLS. It was SSL 1, 2, 3. 3 was actually around TLS 1.1, then 2. Now it's TLS uh, 1.3. So if any of you guys decide to get into cybersecurity and you go to interview, you might get that as a question as to which one's better, SSL or TLS. It's called SSL. You'll see open SSL, but it's TLS 1.2 or better is what you should be doing that. And you can even say, well, according to the latest NIST, it should be 1.2, TLS 1.2 or better. I'll give you a couple little hints there in there, too. Because if you see me, I'm not imagining. Um, system configuration, definitely ensuring your systems are patching up to date, and hopefully the patches are good coming from the company that gave you the patch. Uh, yeah, Python 3 versus Python 2, which is deprecated. I'm sure, is anybody still using Python 2? Anybody using Python? Oh, <laughs> okay. 
And you guys are all updated to three? Yeah. Okay, cool. I mean, you're the only one using it. It's solely on your system. And it's not connected to the internet on your good. But. Uh, let's see, 10 through 13, here we go. Database security. Okay, who's, you guys probably have Bobby Tables? No? Bobby Tables? You ever heard of real Bobby Tables? All right, I got that later on. How about you? Wait, what was he? What was you? No? Okay, I got that later on. You get to see it. Um, that really has to do with uh, parameterized queries and making sure you sanitize your input because if you don't, the wrong query string can't have a negative impact on your information, whether it deletes it or dumps it all out. And usually if you go to a hacking class, they'll typically teach you SQL injections to show you how that works. Never do that in real life. That's only a practice thing. Uh, there was a course that I went to. The instructor said that he did that thing in real life it locked up an Oracle database for several hours because he did the query, he thought it didn't work, he did it again, it locked up the backup database also. So the client was not happy with him. It's good to see how it works, but just don't ever do it. Uh, file management, you know, definitely authentication. Uh, you don't want people uploading viruses to your file servers. I mean, I'm not sure we need to elaborate on that. Memory management, you know, buffer sizes. Okay, who's the C programmers? C++? Okay, does anybody know from here? <laughs> All right. So, vulnerable functions. You know, keep that in mind. Uh, general coding practices. Use tested and approved code, initialize your variables. Don't run as escalated privileges. All right, so this is the uh, Bobby Tables. Can everybody read this okay? I mean, you're welcome to name your son that and see what happens. Name your daughter there. All right, so um, app programming with APIs. Uh, a lot of this pretty much was spoken to during the your coding practices, you know, if you got your API keys, you want to keep those secure. Definitely don't want your private key getting out. You know, your public keys for everybody. Um, and I think you guys said you're doing your Google API, right? Alright, so another thing is are you hard coding? Yes, no, maybe. Okay, I see some left no, Okay, that's good. Because um, you don't want to put the keys in the software because now somebody has access to stuff. And heaven forbid it downloads to the browser because hey, what happens if I do an F12? Yeah. Um, so yeah, can change passwords to accounts. So you're working as a group. Yeah. So you're basically looking at it from a security perspective, right? Yeah. It all depends on who all has access to that. If that's something that anybody can access, especially like a hacker, well, then they get your private keys, now they know. Now, if you're looking at your public key, well, of course, everybody can have that, right? That's how you let people see what you got if they're trying to communicate with you. Now, speaking of public and private keys, you have uh, symmetric and asymmetric encryption. Anybody familiar with that? Can you explain it real quick? Uh, so symmetric key is when um, two people, sorry, playing that one. Uh, I have the key, you have the key. Let's see if want to um, transfer a message. We could, um, okay, uh, you can like encrypt it using your key. And then when you send it over there, I think I'm talking about, uh, uh, 
asymmetric, like the cocoa key and the private key. So let's say um, we both have a private key, yeah. but then um, in order for me to send a message to you, we need to have a public key so that um, when you get a message, you can meet with it using uh, your private key. Okay, so I'm using my private key to decrypt your public, private, or my public? Your public. Okay. See, now he's able to answer that, so I'd probably hire the guy. What year are you? I'm a third year. Okay, talk to me next year. Um, <laughs> actually, probably could try to make shit. That's actually one of the oh, one of the things that does confuse people is asymmetric and symmetric, um, which you'll hear other terms such as public and private encryption. Uh, but asymmetric is we both have a public key, we both have a private key. Any of any one of you can have my private key, and I'll be the only person. Excuse me. Any one of you can have my public key. Get your tongue on that, <laughs> and I'll have my private key, and that's what I use to communicate. So if you want to send me something encrypted, use my public key to encrypt it, I use it to decrypt it. Uh, from a speed perspective, symmetric encryption is faster because there's less math involved. That's also a yeah, question that I've never asked. Which one's faster, symmetric, because there's less math involved. And then of course, multi-factor authentication. That's all the rage right now. It helps to uh, preferred over SMS because SMS is now vulnerable. Uh, so you want to make sure you're using the NFA, whether it's Google Authenticator, Microsoft Bob, Duo, Rubikey, I use Google and Microsoft. Hmm. Actually, I do have Google you know, for different things. And programming languages for enterprises. This is actually, if you were here last year, you'd probably recognize this slide. Um, I pulled this from that because I figured it's pretty much Stacy. Yeah, it's the test of time, right? So, is it still worth it? So, is it still worth it to learn HTML and CSS? Like, yes. It's, so it's okay. So I've heard different things. Some people have said that those languages will eventually become more complicated, where they will start reducing our uh, dependency on things like JavaScript. And other people have said that those languages aren't really even languages. They're just basic scripting languages, so you shouldn't even learn them. Did they say when? Um, I don't remember. Because it really depends on who you work for. You might have a company who uses you know, WordPress, and hmm. you know what's WordPress based on? HTML, CSS, PHP, and I think JavaScript, and a couple other things. So obviously you want to know one of those, um, or you might want to make a single tweet to something. Okay, well if I want this to cascade across the website, well then I'm going to update my CSS files. Um, or if I just need something basic, well then HTML is pretty basic. It's gotten <clears throat> actually maybe a little harder, but I still think HTML is basic. Yeah. I can do it. And I'm not a coder. Yeah. Like I can do API stuff and I'm not a coder. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I know. You're essentially saying it depends on the job, dude. You know, yeah. you're like, it depends pretty on the much. job. A lot of code, it's like some people actually came up to the desk or downstairs and asked, well, what languages do you do? And it really depends on the product or yeah. the project. Um, one person, like one project might be uh, using C, C Sharp, C++. Another product might be using Java. So it really depends. Um, for cybersecurity, Python is probably the biggest one you'll see. Uh, it's easy to learn. Uh, for you guys, it's probably stupid easy to learn because this is what you're doing. <laughs> and uh, SQL, you know, how else are you going to make an injection? You know, you're going to query database stuff from a hacking perspective. If you know SQL, you can do blind SQL injections. You can do blind everything. Um, there's another term for something else. But just knowing the syntax allows you to put all that in the URL and actually query a database that you can't even see. So, um, but yeah, and then actually we had someone in our office, he actually created a job report that was a lot more efficient at doing certain tasks. And so it, it was kind of handy. Uh, Ruby actually put that on there because if you use, is it Metasploit or Cal? I think it's Metasploit was actually developed in Ruby. I think he's trying to actually change it now to more Python based. Hmm. Um, but that's what it was originally done. Was anyone here familiar with Ruby Metasploit? I saw one hit nine. How much have you played with it? 
I think, was it, I mentioned the Elixir Phoenix, which is um, came from like Ruby and Rails, so I read a lot, you know, kind of understood the easy framework of the website. But like writing Ruby code, not so much. Were you saying something? Oh, no. All right, so this here actually I pulled from last year's slide because this is very relevant, especially in cybersecurity. Regardless of whatever you learn, you tend to go up, you think you almost know everything, and then you find out something new. You drop back down. Cybersecurity is an ever learning thing. Um, you will never, in my opinion, you can never really be an expert. There are some people that I know, I met, that I would consider experts. These guys are geniuses in my mind. Um, but even they will say they don't know anything and they'll call somebody out to be a genius. Um, but it's just there's just so much to learn between offensive, defensive. Um, you got threat hunting, which I had a threat hunting slide in here that I took it out because there's a lot more to cover in that regard. Um, but it's just there's just so much. It's like if you're sitting there trying to learn every single coding language out there, you know, do you think you can? I mean, you can understand a lot of the concepts, right? Because object-oriented programming is object-oriented programming, maybe it's scripted a little bit differently. Um, from an interview perspective, again, I actually pulled these from last year's slides because it's all the same stuff. When you're interviewing, one of the things that I look at is, can you speak to what's on your resume? Or did you just put something on there, or did somebody who writes resumes put something on there? If you can speak to what's on your resume, clearly articulate what's on there, you should be good, um, especially if you can provide examples. Um, and if you have a home lab, you're golden, especially if you can speak to everything you've done. Like, hey, I built out these different apps that collaborate with these people to do these things. Yeah. This is where I fit at within this group of people doing this. Yeah. As a Slack, uh, I mean, as a, <clears throat> as a manager, you're a manager or you're an owner of a company, right? You are? Supervisor. Sorry, supervisor. Yeah, as a, um, how often do you look at um, the, like Slack and um, online <clears throat> online platforms to find find hackers and find uh, coders? Like, how often do you you know draw from people who posted their projects and their code online? I do not. Um, we usually have an agency that provides us people. Okay. Now, I do have a Twitter feed that I'm on, and there's a lot of people that I follow on there that are current or former SANS instructors, because I've done a lot of SANS training, and there's a ton of people in InfoSec that are on there. Some are looking for jobs, some aren't, um, but that's usually what I do. I guess I just asking, um, because you know, there's, there's all these different online platforms now that have become like, uh, you know, like Free Code Camp or what's another one? Uh, uh, InfoSect, uh, or f there's like a bunch of different ones and they each claim that they have scouters that, you know, are on there to find employees and people claim that they get hired straight from, um, you know, producing code and producing uh, solutions online. I was just wondering if that's still an industry thing. It may work for some companies. And I think a lot depends on how much the individual is engaged. So if you're putting up these great projects and they like it, then they'll probably seek you out. But we don't. Uh, we said, oh, my team, we don't. We either get them as a, coming through the Centene job portal or we get them uh, through the And actually, I've been using LinkedIn to try to find people who might be interested. Hmm. And then, of course, here, I mean, you've given people uh, the information to you, uh, apply online. Uh, these are free resources. SANS, I'm definitely on there. CompTIA is a big one here. Security Plus, uh, they do that. Hack the box, there's a lot of people that do that one. Cyber has a lot of free stuff. Over the wire and under the wire are both good for, over the wire is for Linux. So if you want to build up your Linux skills, your Linux scripting, that's the one that you want to do. It's free, it goes through different like games. 
and it gets gradually harder. Uh, the under the wire, same thing. If you want to go look at PowerShell scripting, that's what you want to do. The KGB, the computer in B, is about an hour long, and it is pretty entertaining to watch. Um, it's about a guy who found, who was like a 75 cent accounting error, come to find out it was a hacking going on from Russia. Hmm. So that one you might want to check out. Just He's an interesting person to watch, obviously. And that you can find it on YouTube, just the KGB, the computer, and me. Uh, Krebs on security is one of the many things that you can follow. Uh, he's a pretty popular guy. Uh, the Cuckoo's Egg Decompile actually is the breakdown of the KGB, the computer, and me. Um, there's a book that goes with it. So if you like reading, read the book. Uh, Packet Life, if you're looking at understanding the networks a little bit more, um, that gets into the protocols and ports. Uh, VirtualBox, free software, where you can basically set up your own little computer on your own. You have to have the ISO images in order to do that. Put on your laptop, and the Macs are actually pretty good at holding a bunch of the VMs versus the Windows. You typically have to bump up your RAM to do that. Probably helps if you have an ISO versus anything more. Uh, NIST is one of the things I talked about, lighter NIST and all that. So I think that's it. Are there any more questions? Yes. So I would ask, I uh, had a phone interview with a recruiter for a cybersecurity internship, and she asked me, have you worked on any cybersecurity projects? And I was kind of stuck because, like, what would we consider, like, building a website is not like cybersecurity or like project, but what is? Because on my mind, I'm thinking, like, you know, let's go start tracking things and report them. Like, what would be a good example of a cybersecurity project? Yeah, don't do that. Uh, <laughs> Ah, let's see, cybersecurity project. I guess here, there's a cybersecurity club that's here on campus. Yeah, so I mentioned that, and then I don't know, like, pretty much it was like, wasn't good enough, because like, I'm in the club too, and so okay. it's like, I was trying to. What do you guys do? We go over like, how, pretty much like a PowerPoint of like different SQL injection and all the DDoS attacks, and it's like, what that's supposed to like, record and document, like what we did, and just, that would be that project I would share with those recruiters. Okay. So I'd say in that case, because you're basically doing offensive stuff. Yeah. You can say, you know, with the group we're doing offensive testing to see what the reaction would be with the system that we're doing. Okay. So that's really all I can think of. I mean, not having a really good understanding of what the end objective was. If it really was just for testing purposes, then you can say we're doing offensive testing just to see what the result was. So we do SQL injections to see, okay, will the whole database download or will we start to download it? We're doing blind injections in order to see, okay, can we get these fields to populate or maybe aggregate additional information? So that way it helps you get a better understanding of the different offensive, um, offensive attacks, so that way you can better defend against them. Okay. Thank you. You had your hand up? I saw you up the corner. Oh, okay. Me? Yeah. Yeah, um, I kind of forgot exactly what I was going to ask. Um, I was just wondering, like, um, do you guys, for internet, uh, for cybersecurity, like, do you guys hire penetration testers? Like, is Kali Linux uh, a skill that you guys look for, people who are familiar with Kali Linux and all the tools that come with it? We don't have penetration testers. Hmm. That's our old company. Okay. All right. However, if you have the skill to understand that, that means you should understand how to defend against it. Now, one thing that if you ever get a chance to go to SANS course, one thing you might hear is offensive informs defensive. And basically, it's as an offensive person, you're attacking the environment, and you should be able to say, hey, this is how I got here. So you're helping them understand how they can fix their environment or to better defend against anybody else trying to do that same route. I actually remember my question. I was curious, um, do you know if, and like you said, you hire another party, but do you know if the ethical hacker certification is still something that's highly regarded? I think it is. I have it. Hmm. You do? That's yeah. cool. It's somewhere in the list, I think it's
Yeah, it's there. Let's just point to the worst set of women. Um, there's two different certified ethical hackers here. There's the, um, the standard one, yeah. where it's basically a multiple choice quest, multiple choice test. And then there's also the um, practical. With the practical, you're actually doing hacking. Uh -huh. And I guess it depends on the individual as to whether they consider more difficult or not. So you could do one or both. Huh. You have it, or you're looking at getting it. Me? Yeah. Oh, I, um, I was several years ago taking a course online in Kali Linux, and I was considering trying to get it. I never went through that um, whole thing. I just was curious if, you know, because some people I've heard, I, I haven't worked in the industry, I've just taken a lot of cool classes, and like, um, I've heard some people say, oh, you should get your, you know, uh, you should get an IT certification first, or any good ethical hacker should be an uh, IT expert before they become an ethical. And other people are like, no, if you get the ethical hacker council certification, it's like a, it's a guarantee to a job, and I just have no freaking clue who to listen to. No certification, in my opinion, is a guarantee for anything. It helps, but I wouldn't say it's a guarantee. Typically, certifications are designed to validate your knowledge. Yeah. No. And so somebody who has a certification versus someone who doesn't, and all things being equal, the person with the certification is going to get hired. Hmm. Because they're looking and saying, okay, you made the effort, you got the credentials, this validates that you actually know your stuff. I guess one of the reasons why I'm asking you these questions is because, as you probably know, you know, um, I'm in school now, so I decided to go to UC Davis, but when I was taking these classes, I wasn't in school, I was at community college, I was looking at them as an alternative to go into school because you know they are a quicker way of getting a certification beats the time I mean in some respects the time you spend how do you see where you're on somebody else's schedule right because you can just kind of you can take a class in ethical hacking and you can power through it I mean if you if you're like freaking dedicated in a couple of months you can finish a course that would probably go as much information as four years here it would you know I mean there are people who really power their way through that knowledge and uh, but you know, it's hard to know what to do because these, these certifications are expensive. They're not cheap. And you can't, you know, some people just try to collect certifications. And unless your job's paying for them, that's a lot of money. And that's a lot of money. And it's hard to know where to spend your money because these are all investments. And it sucks if, you're, if you don't get anything out of your investments. So as somebody's asking, I'm just asking you because... I actually got my master's before I started collecting certifications. Hmm. So I would say definitely complete your bachelor's first. You can work on the certification while you're doing it. Uh, I can't even tell you which one's the cheapest option to go with either. Uh, we have a guy, so one of our analysts, he saved up seven grand to go to a course. He yeah. flies out tomorrow. So this is out of his own pocket. He's paying, the course is $7,000, plus he's paying for the flight, hotel, and all that. Yeah. And this is something he's passionate about. Hmm. So it really comes out to how passionate are you about it? How much do you really want that certification? I think the other thing too for me uh, that it's hard to know who to trust because you know there's always some new company or some new group that's coming out with their own certification, and it's like, are these people just? I mean, what gives them the legitimacy to certify me in anything? You know, um, and I think that's like I remember five years ago when the ethical hacker certification started coming about. There were online groups that were debating the legitimacy of such a thing and saying, "Hey, we can get you that information and certification. You don't have to pay them seven freaking thousand dollars or whatever they were charging at the time." But for some reason, the ethical hack, the you know, e, the you know, that council's certification got more credibility in the industry. You know, and um, maybe that's because there are industry people backing it. But I think that's that's the thing that, as an outsider, for me, like, yeah, it it, it can be a little um, confusing to know where to spend your money, or if you should spend money, or if you should just complete projects online and get credibility through, you know, people who know what they're doing. Let's say. So right now, I think the certified ethical hacker is about seven hundred dollars. Oh. Okay. Uh, the security plus is three fifty. 
Okay, that's not bad. And that can actually get you in the door as well. CSP is five or six hundred. I think it's six hundred. So these are all pretty decent. So yep. security plus is a good start because that can help get you in the door, but it still helps out your degree. And really, having the degree goes anywhere regardless of whether you get a security or not. Okay. So I would never tell someone don't do that. Yeah. I have uh, two questions about interviews. First one is on uh, what is the interview process for like a cybersecurity role? Is it different than like a regular software engineering? And the second question is uh, if you like, you know, kind of full stack of those bro, like working on Silicon Valley, uh, go read cracking those coding interviews. What um you know, what would be a good Look for cyber security to study for the interview question that you brought up here. All of them? All of them? So like, okay, so we actually hired someone that graduated from UC Davis last year and hired her two months, three months ago. And she's awesome. She's a comp sci major. She understood the networking piece, understood the systems piece. She came in, we asked her the basic questions we ask everybody, and She'd sit there, think about it for a minute, make a couple notes, and then explain everything. And it was like, we're just sitting there like, wow, can we have more of her? <laughs> so do you like to ask like data structure and algorithm questions, or is like, that's what From a cybersecurity perspective, we're not gonna ask that. No, so we're looking at networking knowledge, systems knowledge. Um, I actually did the assessment. <laughs> so, how well you know ports and protocols? Because in order to get from here to a system over there, I need to know how to transfer the network. I need to know which ports and protocols and what they mean so I can look for the vulnerabilities. If I don't understand that, well then, okay, I, if I don't know that 22 is secure shell and 53 is DNS, you know, if I'm getting them backwards, okay, now I'm trying to SSH into a DNS board. That's not going to work. Actually, I guess it could work. Because yeah, that'd be unconventional. Right? So that's like what like, we should study if you're trying to get into like, you know, the cybersecurity world. There's a study like on networks and forums and all those like, topics in cybersecurity. You know, so much that study cracking the coding would be going on with the code. You should focus more on the well, network, so. If you're a comp sci major, I would say still do that. Oh, yeah, yeah. But if you want to yeah. apply for the strictly cybersecurity, like, the then you want to understand the network. And that's what you're going to ask. Definitely key to understand the network piece. You want to understand some of the system stuff, mm -hmm. but like Linux scripting or being able to do command line scripting, mm -hmm. that's something that if you understand coding, it's a syntax thing. So you should be able to kind of read that, well, this here is doing a loop and it's iterating from one to one million. Yeah. Um, so you should be able to figure that out just by looking at the but if you want to understand the networking piece, especially the ports and protocols, then you'll, that's the one thing that you probably need to work on, because I'm pretty sure you guys don't get into that. Because I don't think you guys do. And, um, what else? Understanding. Critical thinking. How would you solve a problem? And actually, there's one thing that I put on the assessment that is a Python script or a Python problem, we're actually taking that out. Um, I mean, for you guys, it'd be a game, right? But some people, you don't have to be a coder to know to be able to get into cybersecurity. And we have actually, half of our people are now trying to learn Python, and they're not programmers. But they just realized, like, the person that came from here, you know, she created all these parsers, not everybody wants to be able to work on. And so they're all working on learning Python. Thank you. You're welcome. We're almost about time, and dinner will be ready shortly. Yeah, dinner's going to be ready in 10 minutes, so I'll stay for an extra five if you want to sit here and chat. But if you're hungry, I'm going to go. <laughs> All right, thanks, everybody.